<laughs> Thanks, Daniel. I always think Price is Right is coming up at some point. Those of us that are old enough to remember Leslie Crowther and that sort of era. If you're not old enough, don't worry about it. It's uh, just one of those things. All right, it's always a privilege to bring the Word of God. I welcome everybody in the building this morning. Welcome everybody online. It's great to be with you and share in fellowship of the Word of God with you and share what I believe is on God's heart today to help encourage us, to help build us up into what I believe God wants us to be, to encourage you to be all that God's created you to be and to be in that place. You know, I, I just love that song. Did we sing that song last week before I preach? Because, you know, I just want to thank God this morning for the breath that is put in these lungs. For the breath that is put in these lungs. Because, and I just pour out my praise to him. I'm not ashamed of pouring out my praise to him. Because he's the best thing that ever happened to me. It's the best thing I believe can ever happen to anybody else. But, you know, I just had to experience God in a way that is not what the world sees God as. To experience God for who he is, that he calls me a child of God, he loves me. And, that, and, and, and walking in that encounter with God, in that freedom to be who God created me to be. I haven't got to fit into a box. I've just got to follow him and grow into all that he's created me to be. And then I know I can be, make a difference and I can be the change in this world and this community. I have to say this community because I don't travel so much these days, but I want to make a change. I want people to understand the God that I've found, the relationship I have with Jesus Christ. You know, uh, is, what was on that T-shirt the other day? It says, God hates religion. God hates religion. It made me think a bit of that, but I know what it means. But you have to be careful. That's a whole sermon on its own to, to, to walk through that one. I want to pick up a little bit where I left off last week. I don't know if you've been practicing your roars. <laughs> You've been roaring like lions this week. Lord, the lion of Judah and the warrior spirit's been awakened in you. I suspect that not everybody's found that easy. It's easy for me to stand up and say it, but just remember, every time I preach a word, I've got to live through the word before I can bring it to the church. I can't just preach to you. God preaches to me. God develops me, causes me to grow, so I can send the word to you. So I'm, I'm actually walking in the same journey as you guys, I just might be a couple of days in front of you because God told me what to do and what to say. But I just want to encourage you this morning. You know, um, Cam, our youngest grandchild, um, he's gone to B-Max a little bit now, hasn't he? But, but Zog was his favourite, Zog was his favourite show. And he loves a bit where Zog's being taught and he's trying to get a medal. And he never gets a medal. And the end of the story is, he doesn't worry about the medal then. He's pleased that everybody else gets a medal. But it comes to the point where the teacher is teaching the dragons to roar. Everybody's seen it. If you've watched it, John, we go. Zog gets a bill. BBC, I play. It's free. He's all right. It's fine. <laughs> all the channels are available. All the programs are available. But I just want to encourage you that, and, and what I say today is I'm hoping it helps you step into what I believe God wants you to be. To know that you can roar, to know that you can be a lion of Judah, to know that you can be a warrior. And I've said that last week, but I just want to, to just add a bit to that, if I may, if you don't mind, just to try and finish off that. So I think we're in a breakthrough season here. We're, we're close to changing our name. And I think what God wants to say to today is important in that change that we step into that change and don't just wait for it to happen. Don't just um, think, well, that's happening, but embrace it, walk in it, and see what God is going to do in the breakthrough and restoration of people's lives, to see them come to know the Jesus that I know, to walk in the freedom of that encounter, know that they can make a difference in this world, and know that they can be the change. And that's the passion of this church. And that's where the name came from. The walk was a year before we got to the name. It, we had to, in fact, we waited longer than that because we had to wait two years for Daniel to come. And he'd been part of that, but that was all part of the vision that God gave us all those years ago. So this has not been taken lightly. But, you know, I just want to uh, really, I'm, I'm, I'm in Old Testament this week. I, I, I can throw some, if you want to feel better, some New Testament scriptures in there, uh, if, if you've just got to think about Old Testament. But I think it's important, because one of the things I want to say today, it's important we understand history, and we know history, and what history has done for us, but it's important that today we don't walk in the history, but we make our own history so that we can create a future going forward. We need to be creating our own history that people are reading about. I don't mean me personally, but we need to be creating history because we stand on the, in the history that has been created by other people. Now we need to create our own history today because in creating history, we create a future for the next generation. And we're keen on bringing the next generation up. You know, this, this, 
you know, I can, and it's great to see how our vision is a multi-generational church. You know, and the Tobias and Mary Ann and the ages there coming through, and we go right up to, I think it's Edna. I might be wrong, but Edna is our older statesman, stateswoman, statesperson. I'm going to get myself in trouble, aren't I? But you know what I mean. Just the word, just the word. Edna knows what I mean. But what I want today is, is part of this warrior thing and what God is doing and what God wants us to embrace and where God wants us to go. It means I've got a question about you and I'm, I'm going to try and answer it. About what does it mean to wait on God? And I've talked about it when I came into this church. The first thing Mike Phillips prayed over me, he says, I want you to wait on God. So I got a tea towel, <laughs> sat down. <sighs> no, nothing's happening. And actually what he meant was serve. Wait on God and serve, like a waiter serves on tables. And I believe that's, I want to expand on that a little bit, but just to make sure I don't miss the point, I'll give you a few points at the beginning, I'll try and bring them out again at the end. But waiting on God is not inactivity. It's active. Right? I want to impress that upon you. It's not inactivity, waiting on God. It's activity. It's to uh, do something and move in the things of God and step into the things that God's got for you and me in our lives. And in doing that, into the life of this church and the blessing that you'll be to this church. So let's this morning position our heart in expectancy and anticipation of him and what he is going to do in our lives. You know, in that song, Raise Hallelujah, he went into it live, he said, I can't do it for you. And I think I said that last week, but I want to encourage you. There's no bully tactics here. I just want you to be all that God's created you to be. I just want people to grow in the things of the kingdom of God. I want people to experience the love of God and know the child of God. So, Lord, I lift this word up to you, Lord God, and I've set the scene, but I, I want to bring out the points. Let me leave aside what you don't want me to say and to bring out and emphasize those points that you want me to say. Amen. Do you know, there's no mistaking that in this world that we live in, in the middle of an election, there's lots that we need to do. I'm not going to run for office. I'm not going to run for council. But a church has to play its part in the community. It has to play its part in the community. It has to embrace the community and help people understand who they are, help them find and experience God, but also embrace them for where they are and who they are. It's not about opinions. It's about people. You know, I've spoken on this before, that Jesus left the crowd to speak to the one. And we've got to be sensitive to the spirit to know and to talk with wisdom, to be active. And to do that, I can't do it from here. Preaching the word, encouraging you, and, but I've still got to go out of this building and encourage people. I've still got to go into uh, the shop and the workplaces and encourage people. But not saying, are you washed in the blood of a lamb? But just, you know, you know, I haven't heard that for a long time, but that's not what it's about. It's about building relationships. Knowing that they're loved. Knowing that somebody cares. Because not everybody has got the parenting and the family that you and I may have grown up with. I know in this room, people need to know that they're loved by God. And they're loved by this church because God commands us to love one another. And there his presence will be. We're called to love one another. We're called to break through. So, waiting on God's completely different to what you think. I haven't got a recliner yet. I'm not quite that old. I'm not locking anybody who's got a recliner, but I've not got one yet. And, um, but it's not sat reclining in a recliner. It's not just sat at 35,000 feet when the seatbelt sign goes off and then pushing back the reclining sign and thinking, well, I'm airborne, I'm okay now, we're en route. It's not about that. It's about being active and excited about doing the things of waiting for God by moving forward. 
if I didn't go home from this pulpit, this lectern, until, you know, and I'm still here when you get back next week, I've achieved nothing. Because I've got to live in this world. I want to make a difference in this world. I want to be the change. I want to wait on God and step in to that. You see, God, when he says, wait on me, what he said to me and what I want to pass on to you is, I was waiting for God to do something for me. That's the point I'm trying to make. And what God was doing is wanting to do something through me. God wants to do something through you. And so often, you know, I, I, I was saying the other day, it's a flippant comment, so don't anybody take this away with you, but I was just talking about, you know, if I go into a prayer meeting, we pray, and I come out no different, now I've probably just gone in complaining. I want to go in praising God, seeking God, asking God for revelation and power that I might change and I might find something of him, and I might find out what it is that God wants to do through me so that I can be effective. That's active waiting on God to know his presence. It's a central theme of scripture. It's been a central theme of my life. I don't have to read scripture. I could give you several testimonies how it's worked for me and how it's not worked for me. But what you have to do is just keep on going. You have to keep on trying. And the fact that we get it wrong sometimes is not God's fault. We can be over-eager, and I applaud that. And sometimes I think it's better to do something and not quite succeed than not do anything at all. Because we learn something. We learn by our mistakes. We don't need to be inactive, we need to be active. So I'm starting in Psalm 37. I'm not reading the whole psalm this morning. Um, because there's, there's in verse 9 and verse 7, it talks about waiting on God. And I've looked at this, and depending on which Bible you get, verse, verse 9 says, hope and waiting on the hope of the Lord. And in verse 7 it says, waiting on the Lord. But most Bibles outside of NIV, ESV and all those, would use waiting on the Lord twice. And I believe there's a reason for that. And this is my study and my interpretation of this. But the word hope, in certain contexts, can be translated in such a diverse context. It can be translated in such a wide context. Some of the scholars and intellects who study Hebrew would say that the word describes great anticipation, great expectation. And why would he describe that? Um, I won't tell you where I was, but there was somebody over there saying something that I thought that sounds interesting. So I start, I've moved to where Catherine sat and then I moved next to him and I start leaning in. And that's how God wants us to be. God wants us to lean in. Lean into what he's saying. Because sometimes he speaks in a whisper. But I want to be close enough to hear what he's saying because if God's talking, it's interesting. And I want to know what God wants me to do. I need to lean in. Really hear what God is saying. You realise just how important it is. It's important that we understand. Now, I'm not saying who's right and wrong on these interpretations, but sometimes there's a wide, there's a wide definition in different contexts to use. And I think it's kavar is the word in Hebrew. Q-A-B-A-R, I think. Or maybe I'm just going to mix it up with var because they keep going wrong at, uh, at football. But we've got to lean in. The word means we've got to lean in. It refines our focus. Brings the word to our ear. Also, a translation can be, if you bear with me, I'm not going to demonstrate this, so don't worry. I'm over the baptistry pool here that's creaking a little bit underneath this. I'm not going to jump up and down. But one of the interpretations is whirl in the dance. To wait on God is to whirl in the dance. And I thought, that's weird. I don't think I can use that one, but it's whirl in the dance. <laughs> different definition, dif different uh, description of what the word is. But, you know, when you think about praise and worship, whirling in the dance is not a bad way in the expectation and anticipation of what God's going to do, is it? Now, my whirling in the dance days are long gone, <laughs> as Margaret will tell you. If you think my dad jokes are bad, right? <laughs> my dad dancing's even worse, right? But it's whirling the dance. 
But God wants us to, we can do that spiritually, can't we? <coughs> Whirl in the dance. If I was doing it for real, I'd be looking at where is Cam there? Am I going to fall off the edge of a stage? You know, we just got to be in the presence of God and whirling the dance in the expectation of what God is going to do. That's waiting on God. It's also used in the Bible, different places, as a description for giving birth. Now, I like this one. Not that I've ever given birth. I've been birthed, but I've never been given birth. So anything I say is only based on the experience of quizzing my wife on what things may or may not be like. But the important thing, when, when, when you're having a baby and you're in the delivery room, and I think it's slightly different to how it was when we were having our three children. But, you know, there's a, there's, believe me, there's an intense focus. See, what God's asking us to do is to refine our focus and zoom in on what God's doing in our lives. And in that birth room, there's definitely a focus. Now, we didn't have a focus point, did we, I don't think, because I'd had all the Mars bars before we got through delivery room stage one, but we should have had a Mars bar that was going to be Margaret's focus point. But I'd ate it before we got in there. But let me tell you one of the focus points that redefined my focus on that, on that morning that our eldest daughter was born. We'd been all night. We'd gone in too early. It was our fault. It was our first baby, so we'd been in there all night. And the midwife in the morning took pity on me. The baby still wasn't here. She says, why don't I take you for breakfast? And I went, yeah, that would be great. Thanks. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> right? I lost circulation in about 10 seconds. And it redefined my focus. Say, no, it's OK. I'll stay here. And if I could take my watch off, I think I've still got a slight scar where the nail <laughs> went in deep. Let me give you a tip. If you're having a baby, cut your nails. Because <laughs> if you don't like the sight of blood, you can be drawing blood from different places. <laughs> but the point of that is not to make you laugh, but to say that Margaret redefined my focus. <laughs> to ensure that she knew my place and where I needed to be. And what I believe God wants us to do this morning is just refine, refine our focus. Refine our focus and be in the presence of God. Be where God wants us to be. Make sure we're in that right place. I mean, we've given birth spiritually, haven't we? And most of the women have given birth physically as well. Like I said, I can't comment on that. But birthing something like a change in the church, like changing the constitution of the church, like moving forward in the church, is something that takes a lot of effort. And you have to focus on God to make sure you've got it right, to make sure we're in the right place. Moving, waiting, is a moving step to step into what God's called you to do. So if you're waiting for God to give you your roar, you need to step in to the roar that God's given you. You need to be the warrior God's called you to be. You know, uh, it's in Proverbs where it talks about a horse is prepared for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. It's in Proverbs somewhere. So all I can do is I can feed the horse. I do that quite well. It's the exercise bit I don't do very well. But we feed the horse, we train the horse, we equip it to fight in battle. But in that proverb it says, but the battle belongs to the Lord. What we've got to do is be in the right place, the right stature, the right expectancy, the right anticipation to do the thing that God wants us to do. And, you know, because that breath of God in my lungs, God turned my ideas, turned my natural ability into something supernatural. That's what God can do. Turn things from natural into supernatural because we said yes. And I moved off the stage... I moved from my waiting recliner and I stood up and said, yes, Lord, I'm stepping into what you've got for me. I want to be in that place. I want to be where you want me to be. It's not passive, it's active. It's a place of moving in the things of the kingdom of God. You're never going to get me saying to you, but Christ says, this is for us to refine 
This is for us to refine in prayer, in reading the scriptures, to find out what God wants you to do, to move in things. You know the vision of the church. And when you begin to grow and move and step into what God's got for you, I know it will be a blessing to the church and a blessing to this community. We are moved like a shoal of fish in one accord. I think that the refining of our focus is key to the next session and season that we're coming into as a church. Two weeks away, learning how to surrender that natural ability to become supernatural by the breath of God and by the power of his Holy Spirit. That's what we need. George Muller, German guy. How he ended up in Bristol, I'll never know. But he formed an orphan. He felt called to come to Bristol. Victorian times, I think he died towards the end of the 1800s. But he started an orphanage. And he's known more for being a prayer warrior. He, he was more known for stepping out. So he stepped out. He's found himself in a foreign country. Right? I'm not saying you're going to go to a foreign country, but sometimes <laughs> going to Mansfield seems like a, a step too far. <laughs> or, you know, we always joke about going and to uh, Sutton and say we need a passport, but it's only a joke. It's a good place to live. Good people there. But George Muller is known for caring for about 10,000 orphans over his time, but he's known for being a prayer warrior. He's in one prayer meeting, and God says, I want you to build a new building. You've got more children that we want you to take care of. Right? It doesn't say in the script that he went, oh, no like BMAX does. Oh, no. It didn't say that he doubted it, but it doesn't say he also rejoiced in it. All he did is finish the prayer and he started walking out and across the park. And a young boy, a six or seven, came up to him and handed him a penny and says, that's for the building. And straight away, Muller went to his knees, lifted the penny in the air and started praising God. Because when you're needing confirmation, a penny can seem like a million pounds. He didn't need a million pounds, he needed confirmation. And what we have to do is see what the confirmation is to see the size of the confirmation God has given us. He got confirmation, he praised God, because that kid didn't know, he wasn't in the prayer meeting. He lifted it up to God and he says, thank you for the confirmation. I don't know about you and me, but confirmation would need to look about 100,000 or something like that for a new building. But he's just saying. He prayed, God said, he moved, and he got confirmation pretty quick with a penny. It's not the size of the confirmation. It's not the size of the monetary value. It's the fact that God says, you're right. Here's the confirmation. Take the penny and begin to build. And he did. Great prayer warrior. I don't know about you and me, but I'd be like Gideon. I'd be turning the the fleece one side saying make it wet on the inside and the ground dry and I'd be going through all that but this guy just took it and began to build and began to build what God had told him to do two of my favourite characters in the Old Testament Elijah and Elisha I ain't got time to read it but I love it because Elijah is the understudy in 2 Kings 2 and when they crossed the river, when they touched the cloak and they crossed the river, he says, Elijah, what is it that you want? And he says, I'd like a double portion of what you have. Well, I don't know about you, but if you've only got £100 in your wallet and somebody asks for £200, you can't give it on, can you? But Elijah knew that. So he told him, he said, if you, if you see me when I'm taken, then you'll get a double portion. So the point I'm trying to make, and I'll, I'll try and draw this in, is... is Elisha had a mission and a focus and a mandate from God. So he followed Elisha everywhere he went. You know, they went around Jordan, Jericho and Bethel. And he kept saying, you wait here, I'm off to here. He said, no, I'm coming with you. You're not coming out of my sight. I'm sure he followed him to the bathroom as well, just in case. But we won't go there. But you know what I mean? He followed Elisha, Elijah at every moment to the point where they were walking together the fiery chariot came down and settled between them. But you know what? Although there's something supernatural taking place, I don't think Elijah took his eyes. Elijah took his eyes off Elijah. Because he's saying, if this is a moment, I need to see it. I need to be present. Now, of course, the whirlwind took up. The whirlwind of fire took Elijah up. And then the mantle and the coat dropped to the floor. And then Elijah picked it up. 
Then he went down to the river they'd just crossed earlier, placed the cloak in the river, and the river parted to the right and to the left. And everybody around him knew that this guy had now got Elijah's anointing upon him. What a desire to have a double portion. What a desire. But the key point is, Elijah stuck to the mission. He would not stay at home. Just like Ruth wouldn't stay. But he stayed. Every time he went somewhere, he said, I'm coming with you. I've got to see you go. I'm coming with you. Because everybody knew he was getting ready to go. So he stuck to task and went with him. You see, Mark put a, a, an email last night about saying, it doesn't matter how we pray. You know, it can be short. I, am, I don't think Elijah even had a prayer time here because he was being tested about what's in his heart. Because I think God knew he wanted him to have a double portion. But he wanted to see what Elijah's heart said. And Elijah, want, uh, Elijah wanted to follow Elijah. Sometimes we're tested when we don't know we're being tested. And sometimes they're the greatest tests that we'll ever see. Because God wants to see and draw out what he knows in your heart and bring out those old trigger points, those things in your heart, so you can see them. Not to judge you, but just to say, look, come on, we need to get moving. We don't need this anymore. We can move on in this. This thing that's hurting you, we can let it go. This thing you don't need. And if you keep it, it's going to be difficult for you to walk. But it's like carrying a rucksack on a 10K hike. God says, we don't need you to carry this anymore. A few more illustrations, but time's passing on. God's looking at our heart for a response to challenges that are designed to make us grow. He wants us to step in and move into the things of the kingdom of God. He doesn't want us to wait. What he wants from us to say, I'm expectant. I've got an anticipation. I want to be astonished by the move of you in my life, in the lives of others. I want people to come to know you, walk in the freedom of that encounter with you, that they might know you. And I want to lift you up. I want to be in that place. But what we've got to do is step into, not sit back. The waiting on God is moving forward in the things of the kingdom of God. If I've got time to read two chronicles, you've got Jehoshaphat out there who is surrounded, he's just rearranged his, his hierarchy and then suddenly he gets, a, he gets a, uh, a threat that the armies are coming to overtake him and he gets a little bit worried. He says he's anxious, he's, he's uh, overburdened with it all and he reminds God about the history of re- rescuing the... He- Hebrews out of Egypt so he's reminding him of that but the Lord says to him this this is key he says do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army for the battle is not yours but God's the battle is not yours but God's I think somebody needs to hear that this morning the battle is not yours but God's and he wants you to know that from this uh, uh, chronicle scripture but then it goes on verse uh, 17 it says Take up your positions. Sounds like a contradiction. It says stand firm. But I've taken that to read because it would say stand fast, stand firm, depending which description you use. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord has given you. That standing firm is just a second of going, just refocus. Just turn to me. Just make sure we're in line. Because the next verse says, again, do not be discouraged, do not be afraid. Go out and face them tomorrow. So it didn't say stand and wait. It said stand and take focus because tomorrow you will go out and face them. And sometimes there are things in our life that we can't avoid, but we have to face them. And the sooner we face them, the easier that may, it may not seem it on the day, but the things that we have to face, the things we have to deal with. So we need to be active in our waiting. We need to be serving. This is not a, a call out for serving on coffee rotor. I'm going to tell you that right out. If you want to serve on coffee, please do. But it's not that. It's about serving God. Because I know if you serve God and you wait on God and you move on the things of God, the church will be blessed. The way to grow a church is that your people would grow. So if you want to serve on coffee, please do. But it's not about that. This is not a call out for anything like that. It's more about your personal journey finding what God wants you to do, being in that place, not being anxious. You see, I've, I've been in a time in my life where I've been afraid. 
I've been anxious. I've been stressful. I've been angry. But I want to tell you this morning, it doesn't matter what condition you're in. Just pray. It's not about the elegant prayers. But just pray. Enlarge. Engage with the Lord in prayers. We're going to get a prayer. You can get up, Daniel. Just don't make any way up. We're going to get up in prayers. It's important that we praise God. We praise God in the things of the kingdom of God. We move in the things of the kingdom of God. We lift his name because that brings encouragement, brings breath into these lungs. As I voted for you, said, I'm going to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Paul and Lewis stepped out 28 years ago and we're standing in that point of history that they generated for us. But now it's time for this generation to make their history and make a future comment for people to look back and say they did this. And it was amazing. Because they waited on God. They weren't passive. They were active in the things of the kingdom of God this morning. So let's worship God. Be active in the things of the kingdom of God. And as we worship, let's stretch. Enlarge the place of our tent. Let's roar like a lion. Don't hold back. Lengthen the cords. Strengthen your stakes for you spread out to the right and the left. Just like when Elijah put his cloak down in that river, it went to the left and to the right and they walked over on dry ground. Lord, we just thank you for your word, Lord God, and may we know the things that you want us to do, Lord God. May we keep moving forward. May we keep pressing in, leaning into you. May we... Uh, experience the birth of the promises and the things that you've placed over our lives, Lord God. But we may experience you. We may experience the life that you bring, Lord God, the freedom that you bring. And that we may walk in that, Lord God, in anticipation of the great things that you're going to do. That we won't be inactive. We'll be actively seeking you in moving forward as we refine our focus to be on you, to walk with you. Because when my focus is on you, Lord, everything else falls into place. And everyone around me benefits when I'm walking with you and I'm online with you and I'm in tune with you. And I would pray, Lord God, that we'll walk in tune and focus with you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.